Thank you for joining us on our journey here to preserve the history of mixed martial arts. When I wanted to take on this project, I needed help. I brought in one of my favorite matchmakers, Miguel Iterate, and the MMA detective, Mike Davis. So to do this, we've been able to preserve history. Welcome and enjoy. Okay, welcome back, everybody. I'm Chris Lights Out Lighter here at the Lights Out Podcast. Very excited. Good history dive we got right here. We're going to learn a lot about some fantastic, interesting stuff with the great Mark Schultz. Mark, thank you so much for joining us again, man. Just such an honor. Anybody who's ever been involved with MMA and had a wrestling background, which is a good portion of it, you know, I'm sure it's going to sound weird. Probably had pictures of you or posters of you so at some point in our career. So uh, it's just awesome to get to talk to you again, my man. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, cool. Cool. Um, well, uh, you know, Mike's been diligent, coming up with a lot of good questions here. And this is going to be really cool to hear a lot about so, uh, a lot of subjects that, you know, people know wrestling, know from the past. So, Mike, go ahead and take take off and let's hear some, some good stuff. So, first and foremost, we've got the, you know, Mark Schultz, somebody I have. I, we're an MMA podcast, but Dave and Mark Schultz, all three of us are huge fans of. So today we're going to be doing a deep dive on Mark's brother, Dave. Mark's given plenty of interviews about his brother, but he's never really gotten his like, you know, little dirt underneath his fingernails, really getting into the nitty gritty of Dave's career. And I think that's something that that's missed and needed, which is why we're here today. Right. Okay. So Mark, the one thing that like is kind of astonishing to myself is Dave only one state his senior year. So what took place his junior year that didn't allow him to at least uh, repeat as a state champion? Well, um, Dave started wrestling in the seventh grade and he was three, three and one on junior high JVs. And then uh, he made the varsity as an eighth grader and he took fourth in the state as an eighth grader in Oregon. And then in the ninth grade, he took a silver medal in the world schoolboy championships down in Lima, Peru. And then uh, the 10th grade, he took fourth in state. And then the 11th grade, he also took fourth in state and 12th grade, of course, he won it with the most incredible senior year in high school history. But I, I don't, I don't really know. I think it was just a, one of those things where he got into a really tough weight class. California is a very tough weight, uh, state. I mean, there's a thousand schools on huge. And so, you know, there was a guy in his weight class, I think his last name was Cooper or something. And I think that's who beat him in the semis, maybe. And I, I don't know. He ended up taking fourth. And, and you know, it's just the way it is. Yeah, it's just wrestling. Now, now do you feel like he was getting, like, um, was he doing a lot in the offseason? And could you tell between junior and senior year he just got a lot better? Or was it just? Well, just easy, you know, easier weight class, or just he just got better. Or what do you what do you think? Well, obviously he got better, but I really didn't. At that time, uh, Dave and I we we separated for. Uh, I left after my sophomore year in high school. I quit gymnastics and I left California to go live in Oregon. And so the start of my junior year. Uh, was the beginning of Dave's senior year. And uh, so I really wasn't with him during that yeah. time when uh, he made this incredibly ra uh, improvement. I, so I don't really know. I was, I was doing gymnastics and then I was in Oregon. So I never really had a lot of contact with him. I had no contact with him actually ever in the wrestling room except when we were over at Stanford. Stanford has a gym. It's, uh, it, it's uh, I forget the name of it, but it, it's got gymnastics and wrestling in the same room. 
And so hmm. I'd go to gym, I'd go to gymnastics practice, and and Dave would go to wrestling practice, and we'd end up being in the same room. But we, I never went over and, and worked out with the wrestlers or anything. I mean, I do trampoline and stuff after practice with them, and they were really fun guys. But uh, I didn't really, I don't really know what happened. To tell you the truth, because I wasn't involved. The first time I ever wrestled Dave was uh, after I won the state my senior year. And then <laughs> he came back from Oklahoma State and he'd be like, hey, Mark, do you want to go work out? I'd be like, no, nah, I don't feel like it. And he'd be like, you pussy. And then I'd be like, All right, you're going to die. And so we'd go and he would just kick the crap out of me like 30 to nothing. You know, I, this went on every day, all summer long. <laughs> want to work out? No. You pussy, you're going to die. Let's go. And they kill me every single day. And then finally, after three months of getting killed, like 30 to nothing every day, I thought, you know, I'm not scoring any points in this guy. I'm state champion. And now we're the same weight class. Why, why, what is wrong with me? And so then I thought, I, I took a different tactic. I thought, instead of me trying to score, I'm just going to try and keep him from scoring. And so I just started backing up and just breaking his locks and just became this incredible staller. And he had, was so pissed at me for being a staller, but it, it worked. It, it, instead of getting beat like 30 to nothing, I was only getting beat like two or three to nothing. Yeah. So it really helped my confidence because I knew if I could keep Dave from scoring on me, I'd keep anybody from scoring on me because he was the best in the world after this, after his senior year i mean he was definitely one of the best wrestlers in the world wow so let, let's talk about that senior year what made it so special the great plains open so the, or the great plains open is a uh, wrestling tournament that allows people to qualify for the u.s international team and it is a stacked tournament do you remember some of the names that he may have went up against in that tournament? I know, Mark. I know all the names. Okay. Would you Chuck, like to talk about Chuck Yagala? Chuck Yagala, he was a two-time NCAA champion and the outstanding wrestler in the NCAAs the year before. And there was Joe Tice, who was the World Cup champion. There was Roy Oliver, who was uh, always in the top, you know, three or four in the nation. And Dave beat everybody, and he, <laughs> he 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 was losing to Yagla in the finals, and he caught him with a step around body lock and pinned him, and that qualified him for the Tbilisi tournament. But so at the time, the wait, 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 hold up, hold up, hold up. This is wait, 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 you're, you're going way too fast. We got to really digest this. Okay, he pinned a two-time NCAA champion <laughs> and outstanding wrestler his senior year. In a turn. Wow. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Mark. <laughs> yeah, he's incredible. And, uh, you know, uh, the guy who was the head of the uh, the national governing body at the time, it was the AAU. It wasn't USA Wrestling. And his name was Newt Koppel. He was the president of the AAU Wrestling Division. And he told Dave he wasn't going to bring it. And when when Dave found out, he, he asked him why, and he goes, well, because that win over Yagla was a fluke. And Dave goes, I didn't just beat Yagla. I beat Joe Tice, too. Joe Tice, World Cup champion. And all the, and he still said he wasn't going to bring him. So he, all the guys on the U.S. team got together, and they all said to, to uh, Newt, I said, you have to bring him. He qualified. And so he reluctantly brought him. And then wow. – Dave went over to Russia and took a silver medal in Tbilisi, which was the better than any other U.S. team member. Tbilisi at this time was the hardest tournament in the world. And I don't think, had there been an American that ever won Tbilisi at that point? I know since then, uh, but not many. I don't really know the history that well. Okay. I think might have won it or something. Okay. I, I, I'm not sure. But it was so definitely he, the toughest tournament in the world because there's 10 Russians at every weight class that were all capable of winning the world. 
So Chris, he takes silver at Tbilisi, which is like mind blowing. And then he comes back and he still has to wrestle for the state tournament in California. <laughs> Mark, would you like to explain what took place at that point? <laughs> yeah, Dave, because Dave was over in Tbilisi, he missed all the state qualifying tournaments, I think up until the Central Coast section or something. And my coach Ed Hart and all the other coaches knew how great Dave was. So Ed decided to petition the California State Coach Association to allow Dave to wrestle in the state tournament. And they agreed, but they said because he hadn't weighed in that he was going to have to go up a weight. So he went up a weight and he beat everybody at the Central Coast section, pinned everybody at state, except for the last guy, he had beat him 12 to one. And uh, this was at 170 pounds. And Dave was a uh, 160, he was 159 pounder like, like I was, but he won it at 170. And I mean, he just crushed everybody. It was funny it's watching him because he had pictures of himself. I have a couple black and white pictures of him wrestling at state. And like one guy he's got, his name was Rich Sykes. He met him in the semifinals. And this guy was a bodybuilder. And he had these gigantic biceps. And Dave, he looks more like a chemistry professor than a wrestler. <laughs> he's got his little hands on his, he's got these little tiny hands on this huge bicep, you know. And it's just it, it's just funny because he's got this guy on his back and he's got these little hands on these huge biceps pinning this guy. Anyway, Dave was just a master technician. That was really the Dave was really the guy that brought technique into the sport. And before Dave came along, and right around that time, matches were all nine minutes long, which were is incredibly difficult to wrestle a nine minute match, unless you're an aerobic athlete. And Dave, he, um, he, he, he um, oh, what was I talking about? Um, nine minute matches. Yeah. And then he, in other words, conditioning became, well, conditioning is still the king of wrestling. Whereas technique is the king of like gymnastics. Well, Dave, back then, everybody thought to be great in wrestling, all you had to be was a great, was in great shape, great condition. And guys didn't really focus on technique as much as, as, as Dave did. And Dave really changed the whole paradigm of, you know, not only being in great condition, but also being a, a technician. Wow. Well, let's talk, we're still on his senior year of high school, and he won his first national title at the U.S. National Open Greco-Roman Championships. Yes, at 149 and a half pounds. And he got the most, he got the Guerrerian Award, which was the award for most falls in the least amount of time. So he's got the Tbilisi tournament. He, I mean, he, he wins the Great Plains. He takes second. In, actually, Second place in Tbilisi back then was a little bit different. Uh, if you had like three Russians in uh, placed ahead of you, they would give one gold medal to the champion Russian, and then they would give the silver medal to the next highest placing foreigner. And so I think Dave actually took fourth place at Tbilisi, but they gave him a silver medal which was still better than anybody else on the U.S. team. And then he goes and wins state at a weight above his normal weight. And then he wins the U.S. Open at, at 149 and most falls, least amount of time, all the while he's still in high school. There's never been any. Well, Jimmy Carr had a very similar. He had a very, very successful high school career. He was the only he made an Olympic team at the age of 16. So. And he, and he won the Midlands, I think, also. So, I mean, you could debate who had the greatest high school senior year in history between Dave and Jimmy, but it was one of the two. I mean, the, the amazing thing to me still is the fact that, I mean, usually you, you had all these guys who are four-time state champs. He was not that he didn't win state his junior year, and all of a sudden his senior year, he's 
I mean, he got, I'm not sure just ama- how much better he got. It seems amazing. All of a sudden you're winning national titles and you got fourth in state the year before. It's an amazing turnover. Not even a turnaround is the right word, but he jumped by leaps and bounds in that one year. On another gear. Yeah, yeah it's amazing. Yeah. yeah, like I said, I, I don't know. I wasn't around. You know, I wasn't wrestling with him in the, at that time. You know, I didn't, I didn't wrestle Dave until – I was state champion already, and a lot of uh, people think Dave helped me win the state. I never wrestled with him one time. Unreal. Now, let, let me ask you, you mentioned that Dave had established himself, uh, obviously, as an athlete, but also as a technician that made him a cut above. And you came from gymnastics, which you mentioned was really technique-based. Did you feel that you were going to catch up to your brother quick or, or like how, how, what were your feelings on that? Cause gymnastics at a high level has to be a, a, almost as hard, right? I mean. Yeah. Back then when I was doing gymnastics, it wasn't nearly as difficult. The, the difficulty of the techniques that they use now was, it was nearly the same. It wasn't nearly as difficult as the techniques they're using today because the spotting equipment has uh, advanced so much in the last or after after I quit gymnastics the spotting equipment became much more advanced and like they would have spotting belts they'd have crash pits you could dive into them head first and not even feel it but when I was doing it it was like there's a eight inch pad there's a spotter you know you're gonna do a flyaway on the high bar you know go for it we'll try to catch you you know that was about it so it was it was the gymnastics is but but gymnastics really helped me a lot as far because i mean you look at any gymnast they can do parkour they can do break dancing they can do anything they're the greatest athletes technically in the world and so i knew even though i wasn't successful in anything else besides gymnastics i knew if i got into another sport that i'd be able to pick it up quickly because gymnasts are just they're they're able to visualize very complicated risky techniques that might break your neck i mean gymnastics says the highest per capita broken neck of any NCAA sport, but uh, yeah, I knew if I got my gymnastics coach actually got into golf after he after he quit gymnastics and retired, and he just taught himself how to golf. He he just knew, you know, how to visualize. Yes. He just gotcha. watch and copy, and he became this incredible golfer. So I knew no matter what I did after gymnastics, I was going to pick up on it pretty quickly. But I didn't know how how. What, what was going to happen in wrestling because it, it's such a hard conditioning sport. And I was not, I do not have a great max VO2, which is the maximum volume of oxygen your body consumes. They measure it per milliliter oxygen per kilogram body weight per minute exercise. They put you on a treadmill and they run you and they give you one instruction, run till you can't run anymore. It's a real fun test. Man, they, I hate that. Oh, God. And they just keep raising the elevation of the spectrum <laughs> until you can't run anymore. I mean, I was at max heart rate for like three minutes. And they they said, you have a very, very low max VO2, which means I was a very anaerobic athlete. I was not a, I was not a long distance runner. And wrestling is kind of a, di- a combination of long distance and sprinting. And so I had the sprinting part down, but the, the conditioning I didn't have. And so I tried to make up for it by running like a crazy amount of running. Just if you added up all the miles I ran, I probably ran around the world at least one time. <laughs> <laughs> but I just tried to minimize that weakness. Uh, when later on in my career, after I, I tried to maximize my strength by focusing on the the explosive power and the and the and, and and using that instead of the conditioning. But in college, you got to have conditioning because if you're not driving your opponent into exhaustion, he's driving you. So you got to at least be 
conditioned enough to avoid him driving you into exhaustion. Real, real quick, I um, I always tell people, you know, with kids, I don't like my kids. I try the first sport I always get boys or girls. I want them to be in gymnastics because tell me you learn strength, flexibility. I think by that's going to help them in every other sport very much so. So if you can learn, you know, flexibility, strength, balance, you're setting them up. So I I, I totally agree with what you're saying about gymnastics. You can utilize that. That's just going to help you the rest of your life. Go ahead. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about his freshman year. He goes to Oklahoma State. He goes 35 and one. What was the reason that he left right after his freshman year? Uh, he was miserable because uh, his, his coach, Tommy Chesbro, wanted him to stay at 150 pounds. And Dave won the state at 170. Of course, he was a 160. He was a 160. 59 pounder but he wanted one say so he's cutting his balls off to make 150 and he just couldn't do it after that year he said there's no way i'm going 150 again it's too hard of a cut and so he said to his coach tommy i'm going up to 158 and tommy didn't want him to because they just recruited ricky stewart and ricky stewart could not cut to 50 and coincidentally or ironically or whatever after Dave transferred to UCLA to be with me and then Oklahoma uh, we transferred there together he actually met Ricky Stewart in the NCAA finals and Stewart upset him with a cut him with a, a outside fireman's to a half and pinned him and after Dave was leading which is kind of ironic or coincidental, I guess, but Dave was miserable at Oklahoma State, and so he decided to transfer to UCLA to be with me. Okay, so you just mentioned Ricky Stewart. Um, that's 1981. He's a junior at University of Oklahoma. He goes 26-1, and one, takes second place against the guy who they recruited, so that would have been a, a pretty hard-fought battle. And then his senior year, he's 33 and three, and he's the national champion. Right. Do you remember that finals match? Absolutely. Well, I was in the back warming up, getting ready for Bannock. So I didn't really see it, but I've seen that. I mean, I've seen it on video, and I remember, I obviously remember that day, but uh, I don't, I didn't see the whole. Back then, there was no videotape. So, matter of fact, Matt Matz, you see on Wide World of Sports with Bannock, that's the first time ABC Wide World of Sports ever showed a collegiate match in its entirety on Wide World of Sports. So, like, the match with Dave, there's, like, a 10-second clip of it. But other than that, I didn't see what happened during that match. I know it was an overtime, and it was a one-point difference. But other than that, I don't know what happened. So... He defeats Mike Sheets on criteria in overtime. Mike Sheets is at Oklahoma State. Right. So in essence, he keeps going up against the same college of which he left. So right. he, when you're wrestling guys that close and everything is that tight, it's possible he may not have cracked the starting lineup or he may have. You know, you don't know. Like the competition wow. was that stiff. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Oklahoma, Mike Sheets is incredibly tough. So is Ricky Stewart. <clears throat> and, you know, the, the, I, and you know, I, I, are you sure that was a criteria victory? Are you sure it wasn't a one point victory? I, no, I, I looked online and it said criteria. Okay. Now, whether it's one point, you very well might be right. All I can tell you is what I read. Okay. I thought it was one point, but that's okay. Anyway, I, I didn't see that match. I was in the back warming up, praying to God to kill me if I lose. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I have a question. Does that put more pressure on you? My brother just won. <laughs> I know. Your brother just won. Now if you lose, your life is over. Exactly. exactly. Kill myself. Yeah. Um, so that's 1982. And in 1983, he goes to Kiev 
and wins the world championships at 74 kilos. Yes, that's right. Would you mind opening up about that? Sure. Uh, Dave did not wrestle in college in 1983. He graduated. So I did, and he didn't. So Dave focused completely on freestyle. And I think he might have won the OW in the National Open that year. He won it like four times. He won like eight national freestyle titles, and he won the OW like four times. And he, uh, he, I remember he was in the finals against, uh, I think it was Tarm Magomedov. And uh, he was losing, I think, four to nothing. And I had already been beaten. I was so burned out from my senior year. It was so much pressure and everything. But I made the world team and I competed in the world. And I, I took seventh, I think. And But Dave's in the finals. And so I'm kind of miserable. And I was... I was thinking, man, if Dave wins, you know, I'm going to be even worse. But then as I saw he was losing, I was, I just could not take it. And I ran down to the corner of the mat and I screamed my head off, kill him, Dave, kill him. And it was like, right at that moment, things turned around and he came back and beat the guy and won the world. It was uh, incredible. I have a question for you here. Now, how much, of a disadvantage do you think a lot of the people in America are by half, you know, half our, most of our time is spent, you know, mat wrestling. You have to get, I mean, we're not focused on freestyle. We're focused on folk style, college style, whatever you want to say, where you don't, they don't have to try and get up. They don't have to worry about that. And a lot of our time is spent holding people down and trying to escape. And then when you go to freestyle, that's not, I mean, is, is that a big disadvantage for us in your opinion? In my opinion, in my experience, that was not a big disadvantage. Okay. Um, I just thought, okay, if I'm going to wrestle freestyle, I'll stay within the rules of freestyle. If I'm going to wrestle collegiate, I'll stay within the rules of collegiate. And then you just did it. It wasn't like my lack of, or my over, I mean, my... Uh, my all the training I did escaping and 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 riding was a disadvantage. It, um, it was an advantage. Collegiate, I call collegiate style a controlling style. I call yeah. it freestyle a dominating style. Okay. In collegiate, you have to control the guy. He's trying to escape and you gotta ride him, and you know, he's trying to ride you, and you you gotta get away and but they both got takedowns. You got to have great takedowns if yeah. you're going to be great in either style. So the takedowns are all the same. It's just the turns are different on the mat. So Dave was sure. really good at turning too, man. When he put legs in on me, I could have swore it was illegal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, my only point about that was if you're if you're spending three hours a day training, you're spending an hour working ground stuff and they're not that just gives them more time to train you know that was my only thought like they're not spending any time spending time on things you are and then it doesn't you it doesn't translate over is my only thought but i don't know i see what you're saying too if you look at guys like uh, yo romero mm -hmm. he had a terrible time getting out from the bottom He's yeah great at takedowns but he can't escape and that's a nope. huge disadvantage to him in the in the octagon Yep. yep. And, and that's why I mean, I feel like that's one thing our guys in UFC, they, they, I think American wrestlers do so much better because they're used to that control. It's ingrained in them for years. Other people, other countries do not have that. So it helps us in MMA. I just didn't, I didn't know if it hurt us. I felt freestyle or something, but definitely helps us in MMA, in my opinion. Yeah. I think collegiate style is closer to an actual street fight than. Agreed. Uh, of course, you can't Definitely. slam, which you can in freestyle, and you can't lock your hands, which you can in freestyle. But besides that, you know, the riding and the escaping is really the key. Then you mentioned Kiev, which obviously is in Ukraine, but in the 80s, they were both in Russia. How did, did you feel like you were going up against a Russian system that, you know, 
including including maybe you know some type of a steroid use and things like that was was that prevalent was it something that you you know noticed over there because they they have a different attitude about those things they kind of look at it as science and not cheating so i'm just i'm just curious if it was pervasive he's asking if the science in russia in terms of steroids and doping if it was as pervasive and you guys as a team when you were over there you had talked about it or acknowledged maybe that it existed. Um, well, the problem with doping and wrestling is you have to cut weight. And the problem with, with taking steroids is you can't cut weight very easily if you're taking steroids. And it it's, it's makes it harder for you to cut weight. Now, there was a guy that got caught um, he was from West Leopold. Leopold, I think his name was. Uh, he got caught in uh, the 2000 Olympics taking uh, nandrolone, which is a, a, a nasal spray chemical. Like for asthma. Yeah. And so they took away his gold medal and gave it to uh, the American. Um, uh, and so I didn't really, I didn't really find a, a lot of wrestlers cheating by taking steroids just because it's, I mean, how would you know anyway? I mean, it's a secret silent world. Well, but the American team didn't acknowledge or at least address it because it's pretty prevalent amongst the Russian athletes, especially, I mean, you can see it now. Yeah, I I don't I don't I mean we when you're competing you're consumed by everything that's going on around you you can't you don't have time to think about all these other things going on behind the scenes you know politically or illegally or whatever you just it's everything you can do to just keep your head on and, and compete you know, with, with what you've got in the guy in front of you, all this other stuff is, it's not the athlete's problem. It's, it's a problem with the administration and the coaches. So it's just wasted energy. I, I respect that answer. I respect that answer. 1986, you guys are back in Moscow, Russia for the goodwill games. <laughs> yeah. Dave wins that. I don't. Yeah. 1987, Pan American Games. You did a little better there. Yeah, I did. I won that. And Mark, I and well, your brother Dave. He he won it. Yeah, you guys both won as brothers. Yeah. And the Tbilisi tournament, 1987. All right. When you go on the message boards and you really kind of do your due diligence prior to an interview. There are messages about you and your brother that are over a decade old about saying they were dirty. They were dirty and they had people following them around. And I, I have another example a little later. And in essence, with the Tbilisi match, Taram, Taram Magomedov, Miguel, I did that one, Magomedov, uh, Dave uses a full Nelson in this match to help secure a victory. And I believe that move was banned at the Olympic trials the very next year. The full Nelson? Yes. The full Nelson has always been illegal. I, I was reading on the message boards that... In collegiate it has. I don't know about freestyle. It might have been illegal at some point, but I've never known it to be legal as long as I've competed. In either okay. style. All right. So I'm not watching this match. I'm doing my research. And it said the move that Dave used, the full Nelson, in order to help secure his victory, was banned at the next Olympic trials the very next year. I've never not, heard that. It, okay. I've heard it. My man. Like, I'm completely unqualified to hold this interview, and I am doing my best. I, <laughs> I'm a huge I, I'm unqualified to answer that question because I've never heard that. <laughs> now, I'm a huge fan of the Schultz brothers, 
And given the opportunity to, you know, take a, a trip down memory lane with your brother, I'm definitely not going to pass on. I've watched his matches thousands of times. Uh, 1987, U.S. Open, Nate Carr, a gentleman that you had talked about earlier. Nate went on to take the bronze in the 88 Seoul Olympics. He's got three national titles, beating Kenny Monday in the finals, two of those. All right. Would you like to talk about uh, Nate Carr's match with, with your brother? Well, I mean, you can see that match on YouTube. It's one of the more popular matches. It's really uh, pretty, pretty amazing how dominant Dave is. And, you know, Nate is not a 63-pounder. You know, he took a bronze in the Olympics at 49. So he never really wrestled 63. And that year, for some reason, he went up to 63 and wrestled Dave. And that's what he got. You know, the, so, this whole idea that, that we're dirty is something I don't think people realize. If you're going to compete at a world level, really good wrestlers do not go down unless you inflict some sort of pain against a joint or something. Like, let's say if I got a single leg, most wrestlers are so great, they have such great balance. They're not going down unless you crank on some leg, you know, to make it hurt. I mean, the, that's the only reason they would go down. And I mean, uh, they're all great. They all have great balance. So it's, Anyway, uh, if you want to score in world class wrestling, you gotta you gotta inflict pain. Let me further this. Nate Carr, he uh, went up from one forty nine point five. He said he's tired of cutting. Runs into the freight train known as Dave Schultz. Gets pinned. He has very Dave has very little trouble with him. And, it, and let's also put this in its like let's kind of quantify it properly. Dave had like eight or nine pins in a row in that tournament. Mm -hmm. Like, in my opinion, this is kind of where he's peaking. Like yes. 87. Yeah. I thought he peaked around 84. Some, but 87, he was, he was really, I mean, he's like, he's, he's always been at his peak. It seems like. Yeah. Yeah. No, for, for, for quite a long time. You know, including years after this. The 1988 Olympic trials, this was an eye-opener. He runs into Kenny Monday. Kenny Monday, would you like to describe the match? Well, Kenny is incredibly tough. I mean, when you talk about the all-time greats, Kenny is definitely in contention for that title. I mean, he is... I, I, of all the people I've ever put my hands on, he is definitely one of the toughest. And uh, I, he had this incredibly, you know, it's like what I just said, if you want to score against really world-class wrestlers, you have to inflict pain. Kenny had, uh, he had this move, this lateral drop where he would take your, his head and he would put it on the far side of his opponent's head and then he would headbutt the guy and lateral drop at the same time. And it would like knock the guys, you know, kind of, it would like freeze him or whatever for a second. And then by that time it's too late. And that's how he caught Dave was with that lateral drop. And, and he had butted me at the Olympic camp one time and my split my head open. And I was like, man, this guy's got a hard head. <laughs> <laughs> so up until this point, Mark, Obviously, or Mark, your brother, lost to Kenny Monday. Uh, Kenny Monday goes on to win a gold. Um, but prior to this, for about the last six years, Dave had always bested Kenny. Now, what I kind of looked at from your guys, from this, from kind of like a third person perspective, was at, in this tournament, you got people always saying the Schultz brothers were dirty, which I don't agree with. I think you guys read the rule book because Dave has Kenny and puts him in a full Nelson, except what he does is he, he curls, makes a fist, like almost does like a, like a bicep curl and then grabs his wrist. The rule book says you cannot clasp your hands. Right. So in this, 
The referee goes, that's a full Nelson. And your brother goes, no, 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 no. I'm grabbing my wrist. The rule book says, grab your hands. Right. It kind of showed you the difference between like a $250 an hour an attorney and a $1,000 an hour attorney. And it always seemed like you and your brother were always just, they were trying to make rules to catch up to you two. And you two would look at their rules and laugh and say, well, it doesn't include this, 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 and this, of which we can continue doing what it is we're doing unimpeded. Yeah. There was a referee that, uh, he was the head referee for America for a long time. And uh, he, um, I would always talk to him before a tournament because they're always changing the rules. And so we had to figure out right before the tournament, how are the refs going to call these new rules? So we would go up to him. Uh, his, his, last, his name was Rick Tucci. Great guy. And he, we would ask him, you know, how are you guys going to score this? And so he would tell us. So we, we knew the rules, you know, down to the last criteria when it, we had to. You know, everything's so close at the world-class level. I mean, the difference between first and second at the world-class level is like paper thin. The, the rules meeting is probably one of the most important meetings you can go to. And let's talk, like if, if you're a guy that's ever wrestled in your life, you've probably never read the wrestling rule book. I'm just guessing on this question. Mark, have you and your brother ever read the rule book for wrestling? Yeah, when we had a question as to whether or not something was legal or how far you could take something, we would. But we didn't like sit down and read the whole rule book or anything. I mean, it's boring. But I mean, we knew the rules and, if, and we had to because they kept changing so much. You know, every time Americans would, you know, have some technique that worked against, you know, the Soviet bloc countries, they'd come up with a rule against it, like the very next year, or that tournament even. Like when I did that double wrist lock in the Olympics, there was an instant rule against it. When Dave uh, did his front headlock in the Olympics, they made a rule against it right then in the middle of the tournament. And, you know, so we were constantly having to deal with these rule changes. So we had to know the rules. Do you think that the Russians had like an unfair advantage in regards to having sway or a little bit of nepotism with these judges? Where did it come from and how do they have like so much power over other countries? Well, I think part of it comes from the fact that everybody hates America because you know we're a more prosperous nation or whatever but um for years like when uh uh, Mar uh, uh martinelli uh what's his name uh i forget his name he was a he was the uh president of fila for a while uh ralph uh not Mar what was it ralph martinetti whatever <clears throat> so they were they were loaded with communist bloc countries. The board, the rule making governing body was loaded with communist bloc countries because communist bloc countries, well, they dominate wrestling. So a lot of the reason they dominate is because they have a lot of their, um, a lot of their officials in place. And um, anyway, they, there's just more of them than there are of us. So they just kind of load up the, the box with administrators and kind of get what they want. They yeah. The they stack in the jury. Yeah. They stack the jury box. Yeah. Okay. So in 1991, he, uh, your brother Dave, fought Adley Varev right. in Russia. Right. Do you, want, do you remember this one? This was 91? It was 91. And it was in the finals, right? Yes. And your brother was down the entire match. Right. Um, I saw the match, but okay. uh, other than that, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know. Let me walk you through it. Okay. It's fantastic. So your brother's down. 
And in the closing seconds, the one thing about the Schultz brothers that people at home need to remember, you guys wrestle into the very last second. Like there isn't a second in that match. You guys can be down, you know, eight, nothing with three seconds left. You're in on a single. Like you're trying to, you're always, no matter what, you're going into the last second. Dave, in the closing seconds, hits a three-point throw in order to tie the match, and they ended up winning it in overtime. It was literally the closing seconds. During the about, the announcer told the audience that the, like, the quality that he enjoyed about you guys was not just about your rough, rugged style, is that you guys had no quit in you. He says this prior to the bout, and then we watch almost just an incredible come from behind victory. Yeah, well, that's the great thing about wrestling. You know, you can always pin a guy, no matter how far behind you are. Yeah. You, you guys spent a lot of time in Russia. Especially Dave. W- would you say that, what would you say, like, for instance, in mixed martial arts today, we're looking at a lot of Russians with their dominant wrestling in MMA. Is it different technique or is it culture? It's culture. The techniques are pretty much all the same. Um, I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot, there's thousands of techniques, but to say that one technique is better than another isn't really accurate. I mean, depends on the person, depends on the the day. But uh, I think that's the culture because that they really respect and and hold wrestlers up to a much higher level status than we do here in America. I mean, you just, you look at the people like Mongolia, for example, the president's got cauliflower ears. They love wrestlers. (laughs) They just- You got a little respect for that. We either agree with his, you know, political decisions or direction. He's got cauliflower ear. I'm going to pay attention a little, a little bit more than had he not. That's for sure. Yeah. I, I, I'd like to see and ask Bill Mark, because, I mean, you're a wrestler. At the end of the day, you're competing. You know, the idea is that sport's supposed to be like a, an olive branch of peace kind of thing. But, you know, <laughs> it sounds like it was real serious, obviously, a lot of that time. Why don't you talk a little bit about what it was really like to be followed around the Olympics by that, by them and those, you know, types of uh, officials over there. Cause I remember like, you know, Georgian guys can be scary. Ukrainian guys can be scary. It's like, were they trying to intimidate you? Why'd you paint the, uh, that picture for us? No, I think they honestly felt that Dave and I were dirty wrestlers and like, I, you know, it has to go back to what I just said. If you want to make somebody submit or go down or score, you have to inflict pain. And, the, you, and you know, Dave, he was wrestling Saban Saidi at, uh, from Yugoslavia as the president of FILA at the time. Um, he was from Yugoslavia. So Dave just puts his countryman in the hospital and the very next match is me breaking the Turk's arm. So now they're like, well, what's, these are the, my first move of the entire tournament. And this is Dave's, I think, second or third match. So they're thinking there's something about these two guys that's dirty. So we're going to assign an extra official. I think it's Raphael Martinetti was the guy, but uh, they watched wait, 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 wait. And Mark, what seed was your opponent in the Olympics? The Turk. One. He was first seeded number one. He was ranked number one in the world. Let, let's not forget that. And you broke his arm. Yeah. First, first move of the tournament. Anyway, uh, uh, yeah, that, that, like I said, that was a freak accident. And uh, I didn't intend to break his arm. I intended to do a move that I saw in the Pan Am games 
from some Cuban that did it to some guy from Paraguay or one of those Guay countries. And that's how I had never done that move before. I just, I, but I, when I saw that Cuban do it, I thought that arm is locked. There's no way to escape that. And, and to tell you the truth, at, at the moment that I threw that thing, I felt it was my only option. And the fact that it ended up with him getting a broken arm, that was just a freak accident. But because Dave hurt the Yugoslavian and he really cranked his knee and then he pinned him right after he hurt his knee. I mean, he had the guy tapping out, literally tapping out of the back of Dave's back while Dave's cranking on that knee. And then Dave, of course, doesn't let go until he's pinned the guy and then he lets go. And then I get, uh, I, I get the Turk and pin him and and then they disqualify me for excessive brutality. Well, let me let, let's describe it. Like if, if you had to describe the the move with the Turk to the people at home, what would you say it would be in modern day terms? In modern day terms, they'd call it a Kimura, but back then I called it a double wrist lock. Okay. I had we were calling it double wrist lock for 10 years before the Brazilians renamed it. But yeah, that was what, what the move was. It was, it was my brother and I, we used to do that all the time, but the head would always be inside. And then we'd either go for a trip or we'd throw him straight back. But in this move, his head was on the outside. So when I threw it, his head hit the mat, it stopped his momentum, but I just kept a hold of the arm and it snapped like instantly. And for all you kids out there that want to learn a good street fighting move, that's the one to learn. <laughs> Fair enough. 1994 Goodwill <laughs> Games. So in Saint, yes, St. Petersburg in 1994. Um, your brother wins that. 1995 World Cup. McClellan Jim at the University of Tennessee. He runs in to somebody from Dagestan, Russia. 1994 Goodwill Games champion, 1991 World Championships, he took fourth, and it's Rashley Captain of Ashov. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Say it so, again. Man, that's, that's, that's going to be a problem right there. Okay, Mark. forget it. Me, me, me repeating these names. Rashley Captain of Ashov. Dave wins nine to five at 164 pounds. And uh, Russia was favored at that weight class. And your brother looked much smaller than his opponents. Okay. So is there a question? No, no. Just throwing it out there. If you can add okay. it, great. Okay. If not, I'll move on to August 13th, 1995 at the World Championships. It's in Atlanta. Your brother is now 36 years old. It's USA versus Iran. Behruz Yari is his opponent. Okay. Were you at that one? No, no, I didn't see that. Okay. Yes. So your, your brother hits a wizard and his hip defense in a way like, I, like I've never seen before. It's crazy. Just like his, his flexibility. And he used a Russian tie in order to snatch single legs. And your brother was limping to the mat. Okay. Was his body kind of having a lot of the, the miles on the body just starting to add up around his time? I'd say so, yeah. So what did you guys do for conditioning? <laughs> well, because Dave had a much higher max VO2 than I did. I had like the lowest ever tested. And so I would try to minimize my, that weakness by doing a lot of long distance running. Dave would spend more time wrestling like live. I mean, I, I like to wrestle live a lot better than I like to drill. I didn't really like to drill that much, but I did a lot of it. But I liked wrestling live a lot, a lot more. So I would do personally a lot of running, a lot of stadium stairs. And uh, just everything you can think of, anything that requires movement, anything that's hard, 
you know, we did. We didn't do a lot of weightlifting because we didn't want to get too big for our weight class. But lifting human beings is still weight weightlifting. It's just human weight, not iron, not metal. But yeah, so I I I would say I I ran at least as much as I wrestled. I don't think Dave ran nearly as much as I did. So Kenny Monday gave an interview where he's like, oh, I can tell you how to beat Dave Schultz. It's, you know, like, like he, he didn't say it's not that hard, but he was just kind of like very matter of fact with it. He's like, you do one move. He counters. You need to know what he's going to counter with. And then you have another move. And then you know he's going to counter that. And then that third move or the other one after that, that's where you have to surprise him. So as long as you're six moves ahead, you've got the opportunity to beat Dave Schultz. Well, Kenny and Dave wrestled, what, 15 times maybe? So if anybody has <laughs> the authority to speak about it, it's him. Right. I'm going to tell you how to beat a guy. you got to be like 25 moves ahead and know every single step that he's going to do, which is just insane. Now, with Kenny, all right, so your brother – had obviously a pretty big personality, kind of a hippie, hippie type guy, and enjoyed even showing people how he beat them after their match. Am I correct in that? Yeah, I guess so. I wouldn't, you know, when he did that with me, like I never asked him any questions on how to do anything because once he started in with the explanation, I just got lost. I was, I don't need to listen to it. Just do it. I'll, I'll just copy. And so he would spend so much time explaining his techniques to, you know, maybe his opponents even. I think it screwed him up more than it helped him. That's my question. He and Monday obviously had a bond because they wrestled so much and they also practiced together. From what I understand, when Dave was eliminated from the Olympics where Kenny went on to take gold, your brother went and made sure he got the workouts in with Kenny so Kenny could take that to, to win gold that year. Do you think he may have been his own worst enemy in certain, in certain instances, kind of teaching people a little too much on how to well, wrestle him? I don't, I don't think so. I think, <laughs> like I said, when he started to explain stuff to me, it would just confuse me. So I, I never asked him any questions. And, and, and he would spend a lot of time explaining technique to a lot of other people, but I never asked him. And he would ask me questions a lot, but I never asked him because I just knew it was going to go on into this long, you know, drawn out explanation. That it was just going to make me, all I wanted to do was see it and then I'll just copy it. Leave me alone. Yeah, yeah, let me see it. Leave me alone. That's fantastic. Um, with Miguel and myself talking about how certain people were following you around, there seemed to be an extra set of eyes on the two of you. Do you think that played into your opponent's kind of game by maybe overselling injuries? Oh, yeah. Did you see that? Well, in the final match with the Olympics with Dave and Nas, you talk about a guy trying to sell an injury. I mean, Nosp could have got the Academy Award that night. I mean, he was like grabbing his throat and he just trying, he was trying to get a, an unearned point, in my opinion. It, it kind of hard to win a wrestling match when you got to rely on points that way, though. I know. But, you know, this is the Olympic finals. You got to win, you know, you, the match was only four to one. It was at the time that he uh, grabbed his throat and started to complain about getting choked was, uh, I think it was when the score was about either one to one or two to one. It was really close. Do you remember your brother's nickname in Russia? Oh, yeah, the Sly Fox. He, he tree Lisa. He yeah. tree Lisa. So whenever you watch some of these, I had to Google search it. So whenever you watch some of the matches from Russia, 
you will hear people yelling this. And I thought it was just like, like a horrible insult. You know what I mean? Like there's a dumb American, you know, whatever, you know, he's maybe commenting about something, one of his physical characteristics. And they were yelling Sly Fox. Does it surprise you that he had, that both of you two had such a large fan base in, in, in Russia? It did surprise me because, you know, I'm not used to having a fan base anywhere, really. You know, I, I, I'm an American. I live in America. Wrestling's not, you know, it's not that popular in places that aren't like real primitive, like Oklahoma, Iowa, Mongolia. So people that come from like, you know, California and stuff, they... Uh, there's not a lot of interest in wrestling. So yeah, it's different uh, to go somewhere like that where wrestlers are held up in a much higher status than America. So Vladimir Mutinchenko, who has had the rare distinction of being a coach, not only fought in the UFC for world title against Tito Ortiz, but he was also on the Russian US Olympic team for, as a coach and coached the United States Olympic team. At the age of 18, he beat Kevin Jackson the same year that Jackson won his gold medal. Do you remember Mutinchenko at all? Mm, mm, I'm sure I've seen him, but, you know, when Jackson, Jackson was kind of, well, when I quit wrestling, uh, Royce Alger was the first guy to take my place. And then Kevin Jackson came after him. And it was only like a one or two year difference. So I didn't really, I was so, uh, I don't know how to say it. I was so disillusioned by uh, what happened with me. I intentionally did not follow a lot of the stuff that happened after I quit. So it was just too painful. So I, a lot of the stuff you're asking me about, I, I don't really have a good uh, knowledge of. It's that's okay. It's okay. You know, we're just yeah you know, talking about your brother. You know what I mean? It's it's oh yeah. You you seen him wrestle thousands of times, and um, here's the part though. I I like to see if I can dip in, in, into Mark a little bit because you mentioned when you left wrestling. Why don't you talk a little bit about your last match? Because we did a little prep for this, and and you know, you you. Uh, on the on the record, I think, and if I'm wrong, you, you know, you fix this for me. But I think on the record, you took a loss of 16 and 0, and there's some stories around that match that you want to make sure not stories, but history that you wanted you wanted to get out there. Why don't you take us through the real disillusionment of, of leaving wrestling and that that what happened in that match that you want to get that out there? Yeah, a lot of people think I was injured. Uh, my last match in wrestling. I lost 14 to nothing. And a lot of people think I lost that bad because I was injured, but I wasn't. I actually threw that match because it occurred to me during the Olympics that winning a Olympic title for John DuPont's team was immoral because this guy was a scumbag. And I, I really regretted it going there and, uh, I just could not give him the status and prestige of producing an Olympic champion. Now I had already got my Olympic gold medal, so perhaps it would have been different if I hadn't, but I just, I just couldn't do it. I could not win for that guy. It just wasn't in my DNA. It wouldn't allow me to do it. And I just, I was so frustrated with USA wrestling the fact that I was making no money, I'm killing myself for nothing. And now I've got this, this, this complete sociopath who is, I've, I'm stuck in a situation, I can't get out of it. This is kind of in my book too, but I don't tell people that I threw my last match in my book, which I should have done. I, I don't know why I left that out. It was kind of, I guess, because it was kind of a, a dishonorable, shameful thing to admit to throwing matches like, you know, like a, like someone taking a dive or something. But 
this was something I did for me because I just could not, I couldn't, I couldn't, you would not believe DuPont one time threatened to ruin my career in a locker room with Dan Shade witnessing. And I'm thinking, you know, here I am, I have nothing. I am poor, I have no money. All I have is my career. And this rich son of a bitch threatens to ruin my career. The only thing that I have, the only thing I care about. And he did, he did ruin it. But my last match, me throwing that match, he did. And I lost all motivation to compete in wrestling at the 88 Olympics, just, it, it, the guy was, he was just, he was evil. I mean, he had a lot of problems. He was, you know, mentally ill and he just was on drugs and alcohol all the time. I, he did not embody the characteristics that true warriors embodied and he wanted to be associated with us because he wanted that association to rub off on him he wanted the status and the prestige that wrestlers got by association but he didn't he didn't work to to be to to earn anything he just thought he could buy his way into our sport and fool everybody into thinking that he was something he wasn't and i couldn't go along with it i, I had like reached my limit. You remember that show Flight in uh, with Denzel Washington, where he comes to the point where he says, I just can't tell. I just couldn't tell one more lie. Well, that's kind of the way I felt. I just couldn't. I just couldn't win one more match. Not for that guy, not in that situation. And I don't want to take anything away from my opponent, my opponent just happened to be from Turkey. And it's just a coincidence that he was from Turkey. And a lot of people in Turkey now say that this guy got revenge for me breaking the first Turk's arm, but that's not really true. I threw that match, but I would have thrown it to anybody. It could have been a guy from Russia or Cuba or, or Venezuela. It wouldn't have mattered. I had already planned in my mind that I was going to throw that match. And when I threw that match, I went back to Pennsylvania, packed up my shit, and moved out, and I never wrestled again. But thank God, Hicks and Gracie and Pedro Sauer came into my life three years later and basically saved my happiness by giving me a chance to go out a winner in the UFC. Well, you know, I have a question for Miguel about yourself, you know, Mark. Miguel, I mean, for about a decade, you were heavily involved with ADCC, handling all of the United States, planning the trials. Was Mark ever considered to go and compete with Abu Dhabi? I, I heard his name come up, but you know, there are different handlers and different routes to get there. And like, like I can give you more details about why Mark Coleman didn't get there, and I can give you more details on that. I don't know if Mark Schultz seriously considered Abu Dhabi at any point, but with his resume, if he had expressed interest, I'd be surprised if they, you know, left him hanging or out to dry. Mark, were you interested in that? Was it something you watched? I thought about it. I thought about it, and I thought, okay, uh, you know, my whole purpose of getting into wrestling in the first place was to learn how to fight, not to win tournaments. And I didn't know how much money there was to go to ADCC or, or all I knew was, you know, after I won in the UFC, uh, I had done what I had set out to do, which was to go out a winner. And, I don't know. And it was in a more brutal uh, type of competition than wrestling matches. I mean, wrestling matches push you cardiovascularly so much harder because there's referees calling you for stalling and you just, you got to, you know, you're driving each other into exhaustion. But to win the UFC was such a big deal to me that uh, I didn't really need to compete after that. And I just, I don't know what kind of money there was. Was there a lot of money to win those things back then? 
I mean, the ADCC. Yeah, Kerr, Kerr got like 50, 60 grand to win uh, two eight-man tournaments. So it, it's something that uh, I, I will say, though, and, and how do you feel about this? You know, obviously you can go anywhere, but it is harder at your weight class than for the heavyweights, you know? So Mark Kerr's success doesn't quite imply, in, you know, is, is that something that you felt too at some point where, where you know, at your level – the yeah. competition does get a lot. There's a lot of guys, you know, that, that yeah. at 170 that you got to feed that even you have to fear, you know. There is a lot of, there's a lot more guys. The most, if you do go to any wrestling tournament, you'll notice that the most common, the big, the most people in any weight class is either 149 or 163. That's just the average size of Americans. And it's different in Japan where they're smaller, but uh, in my experience, being a 180 pounder was, I felt like the 180 pound weight class was probably the toughest in the world. And, the, and I don't mean to, dis, to disrespect any, anything else, but when you get to that level, that, 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 that high level where you're, you're almost, you're going against guys that are not, they don't really move as good as the lightweights. And as far as strength goes, the strength of a 180 pounder is pretty close to the strength of a heavyweight. And I, the, but they're much faster and they're in much better condition. And so I felt like the 180 pounders could go into any weight class and win it. Uh, just because it's the best combination of size and speed and strength and just as far as like the, the as humans go that's what I think is you know maybe 190 is, that's kind of but like my my heavyweight at, at, at UCLA Fred Bona he was a 190 pounder his junior year and he ended up taking fourth and so he decides He's going to go up to heavyweight the next year, which he does. He only weighs 225 pounds, but he wins the NCAA at heavyweight because it's tougher at 90 than it was at heavyweight because the at the quality of the athletes are are better when they've got that combination of size and speed and strength as opposed to just size. And back then when we were competing, heavyweights were weighing like. 400 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, there was a guy in the UFC, Emmanuel Yarbrough, that, that fit into that category. That Tom Erickson actually beat the junior college national championship round. Right. And you see, it's very difficult for a guy like that to compete in a sport that has any level of cardiovascular conditioning yeah. at all. I mean, look at Keith Hackney, you know. It's got to beat Emmanuel, right? You know that. Yeah. You know that. So your brother and yourself had one common opponent that whose matches I, I actually really enjoy watching. And at the 1988 Olympic trials on March 1st, um, you went up against him, Mike Sheets. Mike Sheets was one hell of a competitor. He was, he was so good. I, they, they made a rule. Uh, and I named after him. I call it the Mike Sheets rule. And it's basically, it's the 15 point rule, the superior, <laughs> the technical fall rule. If you get 15 points ahead, you win by technical fall. Well, the year that he won the outstanding wrestler, he outscored his opponents by a combined total of 68 to three. And it was so humiliating for his opponents. The very next year, the NCAA decided to make the technical fall rule to keep people from being humiliated so bad. And so I call that the Mike Sheets rule. So Mike Sheets, at the uh, 1980 Olympic trials, you had to wrestle him twice. And it was a, a very hard fought first, first match. Mm -hmm. um, Sheets was very game. Both you guys were standing. He would shoot for takedowns. And once it hit the mat, 
you kind of showed everybody why you were special. You were past what they got. I was getting to the point in my career where I thought, you know, I, I'm not going to be able to go much longer because there's no opportunity for wrestlers to survive and compete. And I can't stay at Fox Catcher because the guy's a, an idiot, psychopath, loser. It's just, I hate the fact that is that I even associated with him because it is loser mentality as you know, if you want to associate, if you want to be a winner, you got to associate with winners, but the same losers know that too. And they know if they associate with winners, you know, and the winners can't afford to associate with losers because it rubs up on them the wrong way. And it was starting to get to me. It was rubbing off on me. And I knew my time at Fox Catcher was, was almost over. And I knew that this was probably going to be my last match in America. And I wanted the, People, I wanted the American public to know just what I was capable of, and and I and I showed them. So you win the first match. Uh, I said it earlier, 10-6. Mike would explode for a takedown, and he would get it. But then Dave would or Mark would counter once it hit the mat, and it it honestly had to been so frustrating for Mike Sheets. And in the second match, um, I, I think he he was done. I mean, you, you obviously went two and zero against him, and your brother. You, I think your brother struggled with Mike a little bit when they wrestled. Yeah, honestly, I think if I would have, and this is what I should have done, I should have walked away from wrestling right after that match with Mike and let Mike go to the Olympics in my place. I am almost certain he would have won the Olympics. Wow. What? what? Well, so at the world team trial, your brother went up against Rob Cole. Who? Rob Cole, K-O-L-L. Oh, K yeah, yeah, yeah. Rob Cole. And he had a leg lace that had Rob screaming in agony. What was the trick behind that? Well, Dave was a much better leg lacer than I was. But uh, Rico Ciparelli had a very similar type of leg lace. Once you get that guy's knees uh, twisted and into that position, it starts working on the knee joint and it's like uh it's like taking the knee joint against itself and it's very painful and you just you this is what i say good guys are not going to turn over they're not going to let you take them down unless you inflict pain we had to inflict pain to make these guys turn and that's just the way it is so your brother is held in such high regard in the sport of wrestling. How does it make you feel to hear his name just spoken with such reverence amongst the, the greatest wrestlers in the world? Well, you know, I, I love Dave, like, more than anybody. He helped me in a very brutal way. And had I not been the type of person that – had that competitive nature it might have turned out a lot different but because of dave you know kind of showing me you know how to be a man uh he did more for me than just about anybody right i don't even know what my life would be like without dave i mean we're like two peas in a pod right we're almost like twins right i mean our styles are very similar you know, he had a good arm throw. He had a good leg lace. I had a good gut wrench, good high crotch. You know, we had our bag of tricks, but we were very similar to how we, uh, how we are, how we wrestled. Our styles were very similar. A lot of people say that Dave is the greatest technician that ever lived, or whatever. He was great, uh, no doubt about it. But he wasn't any better than I was. And you know, oh, 
you know, Mark, th- this is going to be a little uncomfortable because this is not all right. Our intention is to talk about your brother. But when I talk about you and your brother behind your back, what I usually explain to people is Mike Sheets. Like your brother was more accomplished than you were because he knew how to wrestle. But he knew how to wrestle when you, when you were just starting. Like he was winning state championships when you just said, hey, junior year. All right, let me give this a shot. So I'm listing off, like in our previous interview with you, we listed off some of your wins and accomplishments, but you were winning while still trying to wrap your head around the sport. So right. that's, that's I, very uh, intuitive. That's very intuitive. Nobody talks about that. Nobody, so you're the first guy I've heard to, 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 to see that, to have the insight to see that. So you let's know, talk about peaks. We talked but, offline, but, but, but. just really fast, just to give you props, Mike. We, we talked offline a couple of times setting up this interview, and we wanted to know how we would approach the question because we really wanted to ask you, it, it, Mark, Mark, is it fair that you're not considered, like, the be, be, better than your brother? Like, because, you know, in our assessment, that's in play. You know what I mean? Literally. It, it's so. a layup. It's obvious. And, and I'm not trying to insult anybody. Like, I, and I and I know. I mean, we're talking a lot, and it's this is your interview, but we're talking about the all stars of the all star team. So any like type of, I don't know, just disrespect that might be perceived in this, we're talking about like Hank Aaron, Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Mickey Mantle. Like we're having that argument, not whether somebody is better or worse, or, you know, that person really may not have been good as what they said they were. No, no, you guys are both very special. It's just that there's certain things that are glaring that professionals in the sport aren't acknowledging. Yeah, I think the reason Dave uh, has the reputation as being the greatest technician in America is because of the way he's built. He looks, he does not have a typical wrestler's body. So people look for answers that make sense to them. And the only thing that they can come up with is he must have superior technique. No, he definitely had to have amazing technique. He had to. That, no, I there's don't no doubt know. about it. Absolutely. And well, he was Mark, a also, forerunner too. I'm sorry to interrupt, but did, did he also have that kind of, personality in factor where like you know you were in a group of five people he'd be the guy who goes talk to people and like it was was he more you know personable yeah that's another thing people get wrong about me and dave is dave had the ability to change his personality on and off the mat whereas i felt like because i started so late I didn't really have the energy to play that game. I was just myself all the time. So, but because of Dave being like that, he got a lot of fans, uh, especially in Russia. And plus he spoke fluent Russian. So he got a lot of fans there. And of course, Russia, they hold wrestlers in the highest esteem like Iran. And so, uh, yeah, um, uh, what was the question? <laughs> well, Go ahead, we, like, in, in my opinion, it's, um, what do they say? 10,000 repetitions is when you finally start kind of becoming fluid with um, what it is you're doing. You were an Olympic gold medalist. You really hadn't hit 10,000 repetitions in certain components of your wrestling game. Yeah, exactly. You're the first guy to, to see that. You're the only guy I've ever met to see that. When I was in 1988, I had finally got to the point where wrestling became natural to me. I didn't have to think about anything anymore. I could let my body to make all those decisions for me. And they were exact, I mean, within millimeters. It was, my, it was in the right place, the right time. But I was improving 
uh, all the way up until 1988. And that's really the sad part for me is I had so much potential. In 1988, I showed everybody how much potential I had, but because I had no support, I basically got sick of killing myself for nothing and I, and I quit. And it wasn't just that, it was a lot of uh, just, uh, it was just, you know, you say You're wrestling. Burned out. I was burned out and I was always living like, you know, poverty stricken because you have to spend all your time training. And so you don't have, uh, you can't hold down a job. You're just constantly training, you know? So it just got overwhelming to me and I just got sick of it and I left. But at that time in 1988, I had hit, what I felt the highest peak I had ever hit where my body had, I had finally, my body had finally learned how it had its own mind, its own brain, and it could it wrestle on its own. I didn't have to think about anything anymore, but you're the first guy to notice that. It's, that's not right. You know, like the only thing people really concentrate on is that they had to make rules against you guys, which if you like, they say it as if that's an insult. That's the biggest compliment a person can get. It's like, there's no bigger. Yeah, they made rules against me. <laughs> yeah, I was that good. Like, it's just right there. I, I got another question about uh, the Olympic teams, Mark, because you mentioned that, uh, you know, you first of all, the pressure that you're under there, especially as, you know, underpaid, everything you're dedicated now you go to the Olympics, you know, you know, the Turks, the Iranians, the Russians all take care of the wrestlers. And that's some baggage now. Were there stars on the American Olympic team that kind of made you wonder? Like, I don't, I think in 84, Jordan and Ewing and like some of those guys were starting to be there. Any, any thing come to mind about those guys? Was it resentful or were you impressed by them? What was that like? Well, let me tell you just how screwed up the sport of wrestling was. In 1988, they allowed the NBA All-Stars to play in the Olympics. So now you got Michael Jordan and Patrick Ewing, all these guys playing in the Olympics, and they're making millions of dollars. And here I am. I have no money. I have no job. And I'm putting together wrestling clinics, trying to race, you know, just trying to survive. And what I would do is I would take a videotape of myself wrestling in the Olympics and I would put it in a VCR and I'd have a second VCR below it and I'd put a blank in there and I'd press play and record and I'd make copies of this videotape and I'd make like 20 copies and then I would set up a clinic and I'd go and sell these copies at 20 bucks a piece. Well, I got a letter from this guy, uh, Steve, uh, something or other. He was a lawyer for USA Wrestling. Sent me a very threatening letter saying, "If you continue to sell these videotapes, we're going to strip you of your amateur status." Good. Lord. I just said, "That's it. I I can't do this anymore. You guys are on another in another world. I I, I don't know." Hey, Mark, you put a T-shirt with your name on it. You sell it. That's it. You're out. You're out. <laughs> Let's yeah, that. that's a, unbelievable, what Mark. You know, I mean, that's that, that does goes to show. You know, some of the boxers we've talked to have had similar experiences with the how the system is broken. Do you do you see the system in the states is broken at the Olympic level? Is there some type of help Wait, on the way it. somewhere? Like yeah. you know, like what what, 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 what? I I tried to fix it. By finding a rich guy that liked the sport, who was willing to fund it. The problem was the guy I found was a psychopath. The, the guy that is now the one who's involved, uh, Mike Novogratz, he's a, a real wrestler. He's a very super successful Wall Street uh, businessman. And he's the one behind wrestlers getting a quarter million dollars for winning an Olympic gold medal, which is the highest you're paid for any gold medal in any sport now because of Mike. Well, 
you know, we had the same idea. Me and Dave had the same idea, bringing somebody rich into the sport so that we wouldn't have to live in poverty anymore. But it didn't work because the guy was a psychopath. But USA Wrestling used the same formula, went out and found this rich guy and got him involved. And now wrestling's at a whole nother level. May I ask how you found DuPont? Well, it was, it was a, he, he called my brother and he wanted to start a wrestling program at Villanova. And Dave, I had just gotten fired from Stanford. This is the, <laughs> this is the day I got back from winning the 85 worlds. I'm the only Olympic champion to win the 85 worlds. I come back and everybody slapped me on the back and shaking my hand and telling me what a good job I did. And the coach at Stanford tells me he has to talk to me after practice. And so after practice, I go into his office and he goes, I have to fire you. And I'm like, why? And he's like, I can't afford to pay you, which was a lie. He gave my salary to my brother. This is the day I got back from winning the Worlds. Now, how much more can one person take? I mean, it, and so I just, I went off and I, and I, and I, and I tried to do all these clinics and stuff to try to survive, but I didn't have a place to train. And so Dave gets a call. I mean, I had already been talking to different colleges about going there, like Portland state. I was almost ready to go to Portland state for uh, Marlon Gron is a great coach. Uh, he's a, anyway, Dave got a call from DuPont and wanted to start this program at Villanova. And Dave said, I can't. I've made a commitment to Stanford because he just got my salary. So he's got an extra he just, salary just doubled. So now he's going to and he's committed to them for another year. So I he goes, why don't you talk to my brother, Mark? So he calls me and he takes me out there and I look around. But it was a big mistake because he lied to me. He said he wasn't going to have anything to do with, with the program. He was just going to fund it like he did with Villanova basketball and Villanova swimming. They've got a huge pavilion. It's called the John DuPont Pavilion. It's not anymore. They took the name down. They got the swimming complex, the John DuPont swimming complex. And so I'm thinking he's going to do the exact same thing with wrestling. He's going to give us the money to build this giant facility. And then he's going to have head coaches and everybody run it. And that's what I thought was going to happen. That wasn't even close to anything near that was going to happen. He, he, he had no intention of building another facility for Villanova. And, you know, but he got me, he told me he wasn't going to have anything to do with wrestling, but that was a lie. He, he didn't have anything to do with wrestling for the first three months after I got there, but then he started coming around more and more and more. And pretty soon he was there every day and he was always drunk or on drugs and he wouldn't shut up. And I couldn't do my job. And I'm like, why the hell did you even bring me here? And so he, you know, I, I just couldn't figure it out. And then they finally dropped the program. And it's just one thing after another. <laughs> but anyway. So, uh, do you think he was maybe doing that with the basketball and swimming? Then he was going to kind of wade in with wrestling. And if you just would have waited, he would have moved on to like baseball or something else. Or was he really firmly implanted in the wrestling he, program? He, he was implanted in the wrestling. He, he would not leave us alone. He just... Would he interrupt practice and stuff? He'd come in and he just spent all his time just sitting around talking. And, you know, if the guy's paying you is t talking, you're going to have to sit and listen. And the stuff that he's talking about is just crap. It's just... He'd talk about the wall if he didn't have something to talk about. I mean, it's just... And it drove me nuts. I am not that <laughs> type of guy. I just can't stand it. And I just got to the point where I couldn't take it anymore. And I so, so wait, wait, let me, let me, let me, you know, so ladies and gentlemen at home that are keeping score, in essence, when you've got a boss that you hate, and sometimes they make a joke and there's people in the office that feel obligated to laugh at that joke. Mark's not that guy. He's telling them to shut up and get out. <laughs> You know, yeah, it is a bad situation, Mark, and, and obviously, I don't want to delve too much into, but one other question, did DuPont 
ever come across you as like a wrestling expert, like even just like history or something like that? Or, or was he really, cause sometimes you can win people over that way, but sometimes guys with money are the opposite. And it's embarrassing too. What, what's your take on that? It was embarrassing. It was so embarrassing. I would be at the Villanova uh, dual meet at Villanova. And now I'm the only guy that knows anything about wrestling. And you've got DuPont sitting there and you've got, you know, this other coach, somebody sitting there. And I'm the only guy that knows any technique at all. So I'm standing on the side of the match and I'm yelling techniques out to my wrestlers on what to do. And I sit down uh, between matches and DuPont tells me, oh, that's not what I would have told them to do. And I was like, <laughs> Yikes, that's really, you know, yeah. He's overstepped his bounds there, I can tell you that. As a completely outside arm of your guy. That's arrogance, huh? At, at that point, I knew my time was limited. How yeah. frustrating. Now, yeah, it was now, just I don't want to jump onto a different subject and maybe Michael bring us back, but I, I know in the prep we talked uh, about a letter that you had received and a, a few things like that that have to deal with your brother where you thought the letter might be from him and things. Why don't you think it's true that I think the letter might be behind you too in your... So yeah. why, don't we, why don't we get into that part of the conversation and then let Mike close? Okay. This is it right here. This, I got this on uh, in 2015. It says, my dear brother, Mark. And it says, now this is from my brother. And it says, my dear brother, Mark, I have been trying to reach out to you for some time now. I think that you have been under the pressure of so much anger, pain, and frustration that you have not been able to feel or sense my attempts to reach you. Look, brother, you need to know something about me. I am in a place that I cannot even begin to describe to you in earthly terms because it is magnificent beyond anything that you have ever seen. When I first arrived here, I was completely overwhelmed by the incredible combination of visual and sensory beauty. Some of our brothers and sisters that have had the responsibility to return, you call them near-death experiences, I have attempted to describe what it is like here, but I can tell you this, there is no way to describe it. Let me sum this place up by saying there is no, there is really no reason to fear death at all. Someday soon you will know for yourself what I am talking about. And then it goes on for three pages. And uh, at the end of the thing, uh, he says, um, let's see, what does he say? He goes, uh, he goes, says a bunch of stuff. Finally, he goes, finally, thank you for reaching out to me with your message about your gospel. I want you to know that I have learned and accepted all of it. I hate to say it because you will think I am acting like your bossy big brother again. But from where I am now, I actually know a few things, actually a lot of things that you do not know about the gospel or Father's love as we describe it here. Your time seems long, but it is literally just moments in eternity. Your apostle, Neil Maxwell, said it several times when he was with you. There are no clocks in eternity. And it is so true, my beautiful baby brother. You and I, we are forever. And the power of grace and forgiveness cannot be fully appreciated until you are here experiencing it for yourself. I want you to quit worrying about who makes it and who does not get in. You will be happy to find out that Father plans on seeing all of us back here with him and our Savior. That is what is so very, very cool about Father's plan. It is the truth. It is Father's love. And I promise you, Marky, he loves you completely so, so much. I love you, brother. So until you join me, get off that sore, beat up, bruised backside of yours. I could use another set of vocabulary that we both know, but it does not seem fitting here. 
and get busy living the rest of your life and be happy for father's sake and mine. Love, earthly big brother, Davey. Now, I got this letter on uh, in 2015, uh, August 7th, 2015, and I... I didn't know if this was genuine or if it was a hoax. I thought if somebody would play a hoax like this on me, that would be like the most malicious type of hoax you could possibly do, you know. Some pretty and, powerful stuff, though. Like, that yeah. touched me, man. That touched me. Oh, yeah. And I, I, I the, the part where he says, uh, I want you to quit worrying about who makes it and who does not get in. I had had this question. I don't think I told anybody about it, but I had this question, like, how do you know if you're going to make it or not? And here he's addressing this, and I haven't told anybody. (laughs) Yeah, no, it sounds like... Maybe maybe I shouldn't have cranked on that arm from the competitor (laughs) from Turkey so hard. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I'm going to be stuck with him for eternity now. (laughs) That's some pretty touching stuff, man. And you now, got that in the mail? I got it in the mail. It went, and, the, and the address, here, I'll show you what the envelope looks like. This is the envelope, and this is the corner of the return address. The brother. There's, no, there's no return address. And when I, I tell you, when I got that, that really... I was stunned. Did I mean, it help this or did is it hurt? Genuine, this is the most miraculous thing that's ever happened to me in my life. Did it did it help you or did it hurt you? It didn't really do well. It helped me, I think, because the things that he says, this goes on and on. This is a three-page letter. The things that he says in there, they're not really like meant for somebody who's a member of my church. It's meant for everyone and you know what he says about we're all going to make it we're all going to come back and live with our father in heaven that makes sense to me why would god create a bunch of defective you know you know hominids just so that he can make them suffer in hell forever that makes no sense it's like it's like bill burr says when you when you got a car that doesn't run you don't pour gas on it and call it a piece of shit set it on fire (laughs) now what's what makes it a a continuation of the story too is that you you, what you said if somebody's playing a hoax it's very you know they're they're touching a real deep territory with you but once you took it and figured out everything that was going on there the guy was actually being very helpful how did that play out so that people understand and did you find out who wrote it? Yeah, uh, this is what happened. It's first thing I did, I, I don't accept anything at face value. I question everything. And the first thing I wanted to do was find out where this came from. And so I took it to my church to ask my bishop what he thought about it. And the first guy I run into, uh, he says, hi, Mark, how you doing? I can't talk to you right now. I'm going to give a message to the stake president. And, and I said, oh, really? Well, I received a message myself, and I pulled the letter out of my pocket, and I let him read the part where he says, trust in this message, for it is it has come to you through an earthly man. And, uh, uh, and, and, and anyway, I let him read one paragraph, and I said, I'll let you read the whole thing after sacrament. So we go to sacrament. I let him read it, and... He says, Mark, let's go outside. We go outside and he goes, Mark, I was jogging the other day. I wasn't thinking about you. All of a sudden I received this prompting or this revelation or something. And I had to go home and write this letter. So I did, I wrote it and I deleted it off my computer because I knew it was just for you. And and I'm I'm the guy that wrote the letter. And I was like stunned because this is the first guy I ran into when I went looking for the guy that had wrote wrote it. Yeah, everything could be, you know, that's those could be little messages too. You never, you know, once you're in tune, you know, you never know, but that's that's pretty powerful. What what was his motivation? He was trying, obviously, he's your bishop. This is is what happened. And 
two months before I received this letter, I'm living alone, I'm lonely, and I'm depressed, and I'm I want I want to get some confirmation that there's life beyond this life. And so I'm like praying to, you know, to, to God, to somebody just appear to me, somebody say something to me, just, just one word, just one second, just show yourself just something, somebody, anybody, my brother, my grandmother, Jesus, anybody, just show me that, that this isn't all there is. And I'm getting to the point where I'm, I'm, I'm so frustrated now. I'm like screaming at the ceiling. I've been doing this every night for like two months. And I'm like, somebody say something, you know? And then I get this letter in the mail and I'm thinking this is the answer to my prayers. Yeah. Wow. Oh, hit, hit, hit. I know you're a religious guy. Do, do you drink at all? No. No marijuana, no alcohol? Well, cannabis, I, I, I think, is actually good for you, but not smoking. Smoke is bad for you in all shapes, sizes, everything. But I think it, it, the THC is actually good for you when it puts your body back in homeostasis. There's a lot of evidence. And you're talking to a guy who's living in Oregon now. What's well, the number one crop in Oregon by far? Yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> if you... Sixties, actually, though. <laughs> Was have it, you ever have you ever thought about it may have been the most popular crop since the 60s in Oregon though? <laughs> yeah, I no, but have yeah. you ever thought about psilocybin? Yeah, I've tried it before, and I know there's some uh positive uh, uh <clears throat> some positive results coming from people that have suffered traumatic uh tra like being victims of human trafficking or something and they'll take psilocybin like one or two times and then they're cured. You know, they're not, yeah. you know, it's pretty amazing stuff. So, so you said you had tried, you've tried it. I've tried it. Yeah. Psilocybin. Yeah. Like, like, a, like a heavy dose or just a small dose? Well, I don't know which dose you're talking about, but oh, five grams, <laughs> less than four or five grams. I don't know how, how much that is, you have to take a lot more than you would say. Well, I don't know. I mean, did you go uh, to outer space? What? <laughs> did you go to outer space? Did no, I didn't. It's a different it's very, dimension. It's a similar. It's a similar feeling as LSD. I've taken LSD before, and it's okay. a very similar to that, except it gives you kind of a, a upset stomach. So I didn't really like it that much. Hmm. That's uh, interesting. Now, now, you had made a post about Dana White paying for your teeth. Yeah, I never asked you that in our first interview. How did that come about? Oh, I started a, uh, well, you know, when I was wrestling, I would grit my teeth together really hard and it would like create all these micro fractures. And so in 2008, I went to a dentist and he said, your teeth are deteriorating so rapidly, you're going to need eight root canals and eight crowns and so I went through the procedure and I got all these root canals and all these crowns and then in 2019 I have a heart attack and uh, and then I saw this documentary called Root Cause and it shows a high positive correlation between heart attacks and root canals and um I, so then I started removing my root canals, starting from the back, and because I didn't want to screw up the way I looked. So I started removing all the ones in the back, and then I had to chew with the incisors in the front, which aren't made for chewing, they're made for biting. So they broke off. So I had all my teeth broken off except 14 teeth. The average human beings have 28 teeth, and I only had 14 left. And so I'm thinking, I got to get all these, I got to get all new implants, right? And it's going to cost a fortune, right? So I start this GoFundMe campaign. And then I get a call from Ben Chilberti, who's the producer of, uh, I think he's the producer or the director of Fight Lore, 
the UFC TV show, the animated TV show, you know. And so they want to do an episode on me. And I was like, great, let's do it. So they came and did an episode on me. And um, I asked Ben, I said, could you ask Dana White, you know, if he needs like a color commentator or announcer or something, you know, something so I can make some money, pay for these things. So Dana tells Ben, just tell Mark I'm going to pay for his implants. So he did. Good for you. So, Mark, where I think you might be a little short-sighted in regards to yourself is we had made a mention of ADCC earlier. After our first interview with that of yourself, I had the head referee from Abu Dhabi call me up going, you talk to Schultz? And we went back and forth. And he's like, you know, we do these, these masters, these legends matches. He's like, can I just bring up Mark's name? I go, well, I mean, I don't give a shit. Bring up his name. It's not from him. I haven't had a conversation. He called me up 15 seconds later saying that the head of the ADCC lost their mind. They are just huge fans of yours. I, I think there's an entire market of fans that you're completely unaware of. Thank you. Right. And, it, and it's the jujitsu community. They've all heard about you. You get legendary status amongst them in regards to your rolling with Hickson and obviously your black belt and your accolades in the UFC. I think there's a whole community out there that is just untapped for that of yourself. Thank you, right. And I th I really love Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, man. I had greatest experience of my life. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu literally saved my happiness. When I got into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu with Pedro Sauer and Hickson, that allowed me to have the guts to walk into the UFC and, and go out a winner in my career. And because of that, I'm, I've been happy ever since with myself because before I didn't get into wrestling to win tournaments. I got in to learn how to fight because I didn't have a lot of confidence and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is an even better martial art when it comes to submissions than wrestling. So I combined wrestling and Jiu Jitsu together and uh, I was able to use it in the UFC. So I really owe Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and Pedro a lot for and Hickson a lot for helping me go out a winner. My well, when you were rolling with Pedro, was Greg Nelson ever in that room with you? I don't think so. Okay, okay. And um, my favorite quote from that of yourself, which I repeat from our last interview, is. Yeah, if you want to learn the basics of jujitsu, you just got to read what you can't do in wrestling. That's right. And when I say that to the cauliflower eared wrestlers that, you know, enjoy MMA, they're just like, they, they huh. You know, it's just like, and they had it there in front of them their entire lives. They just didn't read the book. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I know. It, 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 I, matter of fact, that's what really struck me. Uh, when I read the book was I was like these are jujitsu moves and I it's just amazing that they actually had pictures of the actual moves that you couldn't do that were exactly the moves you could do in jujitsu that's fantastic well Mark I, I know I know your brother is never an easy subject and usually when it's covered it's always the movie, the movie, the movie, the movie. And that was like what we didn't want to talk about. And I'm glad it didn't come up. I don't, I don't want to talk about the movie. We've seen it. You know, we, we know your feelings on it. And we talked about everything about your brother that interviews prior to this haven't even touched on, which is kind of pathetic in regards to the reporting world of, of, of wrestling. It's just sad. So it's the same thing in MMA. We're doing the same thing in MMA, and everyone's like, yeah, it's the first time I've ever been asked that. Well, why? <laughs> it's just nuts. Crazy. Yeah. I'm surprised how uh, 
how you came to that uh, conclusion that I hadn't gotten to my peak until after I won most of my titles. It's plain as day. I, I, to you, it is, but not to anybody else. I mean, to you, you probably think it's nothing. To, to But that's actually, you're the only guy I know who, who, know, who has told me that. Mark, that's I enough. Don't, we don't want you complimenting Mike anymore, please. Yeah, thank you, Mark. <laughs> keep going, Mark. Keep going. I'm going to tell you to stop. That means yeah, just keep going. Stop. <laughs> stop. But, you know, it's, it's something. It's something that, for sure, I think that 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 may be something where you know the Schultz brothers, all oh, they wrestled all their lives and stuff like that, and it is a nuance that that's not your story, actually. You know. So yeah, my hats off to Mike for picking that up because we've talked off off camera about just that nuance for a long time and how, how you may be underappreciated. You know, unfortunately, everything else that plays out is such a big story that people are really missing out on nuance. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, if you look at, like, how things laid out, like, we have prep and stuff like that, and we, we talked to Mark, and when you look at how things lay out, you, it, it's almost too difficult to believe. It's, it, it's more far-fetched than certain movies. And it's just like, oh, okay, so you start junior year, you know, you never really win a tournament, but then you win state, and then you're like a national wrestling champion. It goes on to the Olympics. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that would have made a great movie, right? Yeah. That's, why I, that's why I hate that movie, because my story tells that story and that movie does not that movie i don't even know what story is being told but it certainly isn't mine you know we got gary goodrich coming on i plan on dropping the director's name and asking him what is it like being replaced by a white fighter yeah. does that bother you at all because it should you know i mean hollywood's all woke and everybody is supposed to be righteous and very open-minded. Well, you replaced a black guy with a white athlete. Why? And even Joe Rogan said that why? He goes, that's a historic fight. So now that we know that that part is fiction, what other parts are fiction as well? And it basically destroys the credit move, credibility of the whole movie. Yeah. It, it, it hurts me because you're not going to remake that movie again. Like that movie is done. Like that story is told and the story isn't right. I know. Like that's, that's a travesty. And yes. it's not a certain set of events that took place or a tornado hit. So we had to do this or that. No, 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 no. It was intentional. You had meetings about it. You planned it out. Why? They'll never mm. answer that. Uh, it was, just a terrible, terrible, awful situation. It was, I tried so hard to help that director to become the best he could be. And for him to turn on me and basically stab me in the back and use all the trust that I gave him against me, that really opened me, opened my eyes to what kind of person he was. Yeah, yeah. Mark Schultz. I, I, I can't explain to you. Occasionally, I, I shoot you a text message. Through these interviews, sometimes like we make friends, even though we haven't met. Mark, I, I feel a true honor to have spoken to you for about four hours now, combining both interviews. And I feel like I've made a friend. And my, I, I can't explain to you how much like just I admire you as a human being and as an athlete. I can't even, I, I can't put into words just how impressed I am with your your athletic accomplishments I, I really appreciate you taking the time with us you bet it's an honor for me to get to know you guys I mean you guys are you know you, you guys have some very insightful perspectives that I've never I've never seen anyone else have before and I, and I plus you know I mean we have fun, you know, you and me and Miguel and Chris. You know, we, well, Chris, uh, he, he, normally he goes on a run. Chris is working right now, which I'm sure would get him in trouble, but he doesn't really care. So 
like it, it's just it keeps he keeps getting called on runs during yeah. our interviews. He's a fireman, right? <laughs> right. Nice. Uh, no... okay. So, but yeah, Mark, d- definitely deeply appreciated. We, you know, we've been inspired enough that to know that the, the the whole wrestling community probably has a lot of guys with a lot of stories that are going to get lost and. And we're going to try to try to delve more into that. We got Mark Coleman trying to help us with the guy you mentioned, and we want to interview Royce Algie too. Um, you know, and Mike's got a whole list and a whole plan and stuff. And a, really, not a large part. All of that was inspired by us talking to you that first time. So I, I absolutely thank you very very much, man. Thank you. We never would have done it without you, for sure. Oh, awesome. Uh, thanks for telling me that. That's for sure. Awesome. So, uh, you know, until we meet again, we'll probably do a third edition. This time we're going to have Lytle tied down, so I can't leave or anything like that. But uh, <laughs> until until the next time, I'm going to cut it off here because I'm in a rainstorm. Uh, okay. So, so yeah. Mark, in the future, I think we pull in one of your wrestling buddies or something like that and we'll do a little deep dive. I think that'd be really cool, man. It kind of get your perspective or because you're real introspective as well. And – I'd like to kind of pick apart other wrestlers and just kind of get some stories out of them. And we'd love to have you on board for that. You bet. Anytime, man. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Take care, buddy. Well, Lights Out Podcast here. Back with another fantastic episode. We're in legendary territory again. A second visit from Mark Schultz in the books, Mike. And just as powerful as the first one, I think. I don't, or close. Yeah, the first one is is like an interview that he that Mark has has tweeted out several times as like his if there's one interview that he had a point at you know that that was definitive of him and his career he really enjoyed our first interview so this was our second obviously involving his brother Dave and I have gone on and watched the Schultz brothers videos. To almost like a, a point of embarrassment and like I'm sending them to my brother in Florida, sending them to Chris and the, Mark Schultz is one of my heroes. And to be able to connect with him on this level and have him accept my understanding, my, I, I'm going to say it's limited. It's, it's definitely not a limited understanding of wrestling, but it's certainly not like somebody that has a podcast 24 seven on wrestling. Like the guys I know, I really know well, but it occupies a lot of my MMA time. So I just try to focus on what I like and, you know, try to go back to, you know, what it is I do. But Mark Schultz is one of my heroes. And talking about his brother, Dave, you can still, there's, there's some pain. There's obviously still some pain there. And like, if I had to kind of rewind and, throw some names at him, Walt Bayless. We should have asked about Walt Bayless and his stance on Russian athletes competing um, like on the world stage because the Olympics that he participated in, they weren't allowed to participate. And after that happened, he and his brother went to Russia in order to go give the people that they felt deserved a shot, you know, they're just due. It's just... Man, the guy, the guy, he's, he's a throwback character, like a World War II type guy. That's just an absolute badass. Yeah. I remember one time I was judging an Abu Dhabi tournament and one fighter was <clears throat> breaking the rules. So I was told by the, by the directors, you know, call a timeout and go explain the rules to his coach. So I had to walk out and explain the, the rules to Carlson Gracie Sr. And that's a little bit like I think what you're trying to, point out with Mark Schultz. It's like, that we're yeah, really not yeah. qualified, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but we're really grateful that Mark gave us the time. Yeah. He was very really yeah. he, he elevated our game. So I'm, I'm really proud of him and uh, for, you know, liking us too. I'm, 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 I'm yeah. really proud yeah. rather that he likes us. You know what I mean? So. And, and he's not a guy that kisses anybody's ass. He's not. Right. right. And I think, I think, you know, we talked about a potential future segment. I, I'd like to, see that happen you know we can bring in i'm sure the wrestlers will be proud to have a forum to tell their stories because i i think that that's what they are they're not a tight-knit group because there is a camaraderie that camaraderie of the early days of mma i think that wrestling 
when it's at its purest form, shares some of that. So uh, I'm looking forward to all that. Mark Schultz, and like you said, he's an, an American hero, no doubt. Yeah, American hero. Like if I had to throw like a wrestler off the top of my head, I mean, you had heard, well, the person that replaced me was Royce Elger. Royce Elger, from what I gather, I've talked to Mark Coleman about him, phenomenal storyteller, great guy, doesn't hold much back. And, you know, when and you talk about the handing of the baton on the United States world team, that's what it is. It's kind of like you can trace those bloodlines, like the lineage of it. And it's not a difficult thing to do. And anybody that's even spoken, um, you know, within that subject matter is somebody that is I, absolutely one of the greatest wrestlers to walk the planet. That's for sure. So, yep. Uh, thank you to Mark Schultz once again. Another Lights Out podcast in the books and uh, more to come. Stay tuned. We got we got to get Mark back. We have to have this guy back. Like yeah, we got to get him. I think we we got to make him part of the team and we got to bring other wrestlers along with him so that they could you know we can experience some of that camaraderie with, yeah. with Mark on the wrestler side. You know, there's you know with Mark Coleman with you know Tom Erickson. Shout out to Gary Myers, who's a Rolodex, walking Rolodex. You know, we we think we can get into some wrestling guys that have never been, uh, you know, given a forum like this before. And uh, I'm looking forward to it a lot. Uh, always the toughest guys on the planet. Yeah. Well, like, share, subscribe. If you want this twice a week, you have to share and subscribe it. Uh, yeah, up until that time, we're just going to try to drop these things once a week. <laughs> Once a week with some other side projects and stuff, never yeah. sleeping over yeah. here. So, you know, keep, yeah. keep, keep sharing, keep liking, keep subscribing. We'll keep documenting history. Thank you to Chris Lytle too. And uh, Chris, maybe you'll show up in one of these, you know, one of these. Maybe, you Thanks know, maybe you can just kind of play hooky at, at you know, when the fire department calls. <laughs> yeah, I mean, someone else can save the kittens. <laughs> All right, brother. Be good. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.